Hey there, everyone. Welcome to part 14 of Let's Consider Luke. It is for posterity's sake. It's February 7th, 2022 years. Yeah, fill in the blank. I'm going to start doing this in this format where I, um, I do this picture in picture and move it down here, make sure it's not in the way. I've tried to adjust this to give it a little more, but I don't know how to do that yet. You know, make the the video part bigger. Anyways, doing this just because there are a lot of people that do actually watch these when, when I'm doing video uh, of me, and I can understand that I do the same because there's more of an interactive element there. If I just produce these with just the screen, it's it is less interactive. So that's that's why it's um, really for no other reason. So I spent a long time now uh, on these because we're coming to the last few chapters of Luke. We're in Luke twenty-one, and um, so that would be considered, I guess, what a lot of uh, religionists would call the passion. It's so when you get in the passion. So this is this is Jesus coming to Jerusalem for the last time. Basic overview, you know, Last Supper. Uh, in this case, Olivet Discourse. And uh, then you have the trial. You have crucifixion, burial, resurrection, and then different gospels vary. Um, they all vary. Now, what's interesting about this, and why I spent uh, probably way more time than I needed to, maybe, or not enough, on Luke 21, and, and I got at least some of 22. Because for one thing, I really think, not just at this point in time, but the whole way, from start to finish, that Luke... Not only Luke, all the Gospels, Luke, Matthew, Mark, John, maybe even Gnostic Gospels, should be perhaps examined in a different way. The, the point to let's consider Luke was really just to take a Gospel that I thought, for one thing, I saw the most striking oddities in the sense of um, not harmonizing very well with other Gospels. And of course, everybody knows by now, I'm using Matthew as the control, not because I think Matthew's perfect either, but because I think it's probably the closest to following along with and being harmonious with uh, the bulk of the Law and the Prophets. But the funny thing is, and this is going to be illustrated in this one, there are times when either, for instance, I've rabbit trailed on Matthew before, sections of Matthew are very difficult to reconcile with the Law and the Prophets, and we don't want to see that. If we want to see, for instance, if we want to see Jesus as the Messiah and perfect, he has to perfectly comport with the Law and the Prophets. So we don't, we don't want to see that. What I want to see is what is. Years ago, um, I, years ago, I, you know, I, I think I, I started as um, a very uh, zealous Protestant uh, even Ill evangelical Christian, in in the way I would go about defending the Bible, and it would be looked at as defending the Bible, as in defending the sixty six books of the Bible, as as though those sixty six books of the Bible were all inspired, all belonged there, and were all perfect and not contradictory. And when you find contradictions, of course, there's always a reason for it. And of course, the critics are just being critical because, um, who knows? They're full of the devil. 
But that's honestly where I started years ago. And um, that's why I leave a lot of my old stuff up. It's just progress. Today, I, I feel that my responsibility is always just reporting what I find. Yes, there still is a lot of defense concerning Scripture and the Scripture that I find to be the most, uh, let's say, to, that has the, the greatest amount of signs and evidence of being inspired. I don't see that in all of what is considered uh, acceptable, you know, canonized Scripture. The funny thing is, we start in Luke 21, it's the Olivet Discourse. Now, if it was paralleling Matthew, it would have to parallel Matthew 24 and 25. For those who are even vaguely familiar with Matthew 24 and 25, those two chapters are a very long, very in-depth discourse. And that's one of the biggest differences that we're going to see between um, Luke 21 and uh, Matthew 24 and 25. Because Luke 21, the Olivet Discourse, as a, according to Luke, really just spans these um, about 30 verses. Whereas, when you go to Matthew, as I said, you have two chapters that this covers, the, the first one being 50 verses and the second one being nearly 50, 46, 46 verses. Matthew 25 is uh, mostly parables, but they directly relate to what's being said in Matthew 24. And that's just on its surface. That's one of the biggest differences that we're going to see between Matthew and Luke. Now, I will uh, refer to my notes as we go along, and hopefully they'll be uh, enlightening. So, for starters, in Luke's version of the Olivet Discourse in Luke 21, uh, it is preceded, the discourse itself is preceded by the widow's might. So, there's an instance where this widow throws uh, uh, the last bit of her money in her, or let's say a small amount of money, but it was a large amount of money to her. It is found in the Gospel of Mark, and it is not found in Matthew. Matthew's is preceded by a long discourse concerning the great hypocrisy of the leaders and people. What was wrong with the nation and the lament over Jerusalem, which we saw is entirely out of place in, the, in order in Luke. In Luke... Um, when he laments over Jerusalem, and it's nearly word for word as what it is in Matthew, it is in, the, there's multiple times that Jesus goes up to Jerusalem in these, in these Gospels, in any given Gospel. And in Luke, it would be a trip bef before this, that he was in Jerusalem where he has his lament over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, uh, you who killed the prophets. Uh, how I would have gathered you as a hen gathers uh, her chicks, but but you would not. It's very similar in Luke and Matthew, but it's entirely out of place in Luke. As with Matthew, and the thing is in Matthew, it, it makes contextually. If both of these Gospels, let's just say, if both of these Gospels were erroneous, I'm not saying that, but for the sake of argument, if they were, if both of them were fiction, for the sake of argument, Matthew's would actually be, in my opinion, far more coherent in its form, in the way it contextualizes really important passages, um, really important dialogue, things that we see Jesus saying. Matthew seems to be far better with that sort of uh, contextual kind of flow than, than, than what Luke is. So, um, yeah, in Luke, starting at 21.1, it says he looked up, he saw the rich men, 
casting their gifts into the treasury and and he said he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither then there two mites and he said of a truth i say to you that this poor widow has cast in more than they all by proportion of course for all these have of their abundance cast into the offering of god but she of her penury or her lack has cast in all the living that she had which is a, would be a true statement um just a few things about that first off if that was an offering box um so the law the law for israel and judah because judah's part of israel was in order to make the system of of government and social interaction that that covers a lot of the law government social interaction um it made it to where it, it could work we see a form of it today of course but it, the form that we see of it today in the sense of like governments applying certain sorts of of taxes and then those taxes are supposed to be used in theory to take care of um, certain projects uh, like infrastructure um, unfortunately you know it, a lot of it seems to go towards things that really shouldn't be provided by the government because every time the government provides something um, there's always a catch there's always a caveat with it okay but in in the law as given to israel as per the agreement at mount horeb um there was a there was a tithe it's, tithe is just a, a translated word from this tenth it's not transliterated because the word is quite different in uh, in obri but that's essentially what it was it comes from the word um osher which sometimes is actually trans related as wealth or abundance interesting right because if what you're doing is you're giving this portion of your abundance you're not giving you're not expected to give you know like digging into your i i, I suppose your necessities but you can people would also give offerings you could freely give offerings those are defined as different words um, some people believe that Kareb is one of those words where it denotes a free will offering. There's other words used that are translated as offering, free will offering. Okay, that's probably what this would be. Um, I'm not sure how this casts a bad light on either those running the temple per se because we don't find out about them he's not here in luke we don't get a sense of what's good what's bad you know what what we do if we just looked at luke we we didn't really have much else to go on but this no other gospels to compare um maybe we didn't know the law very well maybe the translations of the law that we were having to read a century or two ago um where we're just as poor as today we didn't have the tools where we could weigh these things and we're looking at this and what are we getting out of it we're getting out of it that the this widow is being held up as as being really laudable because she's done something so great she's given so much of what was hers to the to the temple which who knows what that might be used for and look if if the people running the place were as corrupt as they certainly seem to be in all the gospels um i don't know i think i would have stopped her and advised her maybe she should keep that money and use it for something a little better because the people running the place were just utterly corrupt that's not even arguable i think every gospel actually <laughs> highlights that just in different ways so uh, 
I'm not sure if I get the point of that, whether that was Luke or Mark, and we still don't actually know the authorship of Mark. Uh, a lot of people speculate that Mark came first and the Matthew came second, and I really don't buy that whatsoever. Uh, I think Mark is just very obviously uh, like a, a truncated, condensed cliff note version of Matthew. And I, I honestly think that Matthew was used as a source for whoever put together Luke. And be, because here's why. We can see that there is a, a whole lot of material from Matthew in Luke. But it's so cherry-picked. And it is oftentimes in such bizarre locations that what I would think, if I'm, I'm looking at these, I would say, you know, wow, I, you know, whoever wrote Luke, whether it was a guy named Luke or not, or a guy named Josephus, or a guy who went by both, whoever wrote this, it's so strange to me because he's clearly pulling from Matthew, but why is he so radically putting passages in these very strange contexts and not keeping them in the context which if you go and you refer to Matthew everything that we've covered so far there is a there's a context with these verses that we see in Luke and we say okay there's a parallel verse over here in Matthew but it's completely out of context look let's just take Let's just take, for example, real quick, the fact that I put in the notes that um, there was, of course, the um, in Matthew's version of the Olivet Discourse, it is pre uh, preceded by him really haranguing all of the leaders and uh, the people of Judah. And then at the end, he puts in his, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Uh, that kills the prophets and stones them which are sent to thee. How often would I gather thy children, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For so I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till you say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Now, a couple of things that's interesting about that. First off is, this whole chapter, Matthew 23, it starts with then Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples saying, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses. See, and he, he goes on this discourse and he's speaking to the multitude. He's speaking to his disciples. There's a lot of people in his hearing. He's in a very public place, like, like the temple complex area, which as far as I'm concerned, we'll get into would have to be far, far larger than the the literal square footage of what they say is the Temple Mount today in Palestine. He ends this whole discourse in Matthew 23, this very critical discourse to the people, his disciples, a lot of people present, of course, scribes and Pharisees would have been there too, with this lament over Jerusalem. And it's all in context. And he's speaking directly to these people. He's speaking to these people in the term Jerusalem. He's calling all of them Jerusalem. There's our context. So, as a quick reference, remember, it was way out of context in Luke 13, 34. So, we'll jam back here real fast to Luke 13 and 34. Now, at this point, he precedes this with some parables. There's the woman with a disabling spirit. Um, the mustard seed and leaven, another parable, the narrow door parable, um, and then the lament over Jerusalem. And it's preceded by the same day there came certain Pharisees, saying unto him, Get out and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. Remember, this is like this is like maybe the second time he was in Jerusalem. This is not the last time. That's the first problem, of course. And he said to, to them, now he's speaking to these Pharisees, because it said, just they came to him saying, Herod's going to kill you. You need to you need to run. Go, you tell that fox, behold, I cast out devils. I do cure uh, today, tomorrow, and the third day. 
I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which kill the prophets and stone them that are sent. Okay. It's an entirely different context. Now, if I were to backtrack in my notes, I could give you a much more specific context here in Luke, but you get the point. Just that little, just that little thing, our control being Matthew, and that it is preceded by this discourse uh, very openly and publicly to the people and to his disciples in the hearing of all, ending with that lament over Jerusalem and how radically different it is from Luke, and how in Luke they start out the the prequel to the um, you know, <laughs> Olivet Discord. I'm, I'm sorry makes it this widow's might, which we don't really have a great reference to as far as how are we supposed to put this into our ethical um, overall mindset concerning the way that we're looking at Jesus, the way that we're looking at um, Christianity, this worldview and everything. How do we put this in there? Can we compare this to the Law and the Prophets? What is it telling us? And it is telling us something vastly different than what Matthew is telling us. Now, moving forward, we have um, the comparison between uh, Luke 21, 5 and 6 and Matthew 24, um, 1 and 2. So in Luke 24, 5 and 6, it says, And as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, As for these things which you behold, the days come in which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And then now Matthew 24, 1 and 2. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily, I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Okay, They are essentially quite parallel and could be considered quite complementary. But um, Luke 21, 6 slash Matthew 24, 2, virtually the same, not one stone left. For one thing, one must really consider whether or not the mount that the the temple. So, if we're going by the the establishment model, that that structure with the the wailing wall where they go go to, you know, and all that. If that's actually part of the temple or not, and figure this prophecy, why? Well, because based on their model. There was uh, the mount built up, so if you want to build a structure like that, you have to you have to have earthworks. Depending on whether or not you're going to have things below that, and so on and so forth. <sighs> Based on our knowledge, it doesn't appear that that's the case. Are there tunnels underneath there that somebody dug at one point in time? Maybe, but we we would really not have any reason to think that. Uh, that was necessarily original, and even if it was, you have to build up. Um, you have to do a certain amount of excavation, pull from certain places, which could explain why there is the sharp, um, in Palestine, Jerusalem, why there is the very sharply defined uh, ravine uh, on the east, and why it seems so sheer, like going right up uh, again into in this, um, this Temple Mount area. Why? Because we've... Most of us have seen them build even just highways. If they're going to put in a clover leaf or something, that's massive. Because what you have to do when you're figuring excavation and earthworks for any structure, whether it's a building, um, whether it's, you know, road or anything, you're building up um, two sides of a bridge. That's a lot of earth. It's a lot of earth that you have to take from somewhere. And if you have to have the earth shipped in, oh, the expense really goes up. Always, 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 always try to figure for how much land you can take 
from right there and where you can take it from and put it there and build it up okay so that that mount area no matter how much they used or anybody wants to argue that underneath there is part of the there's no mountains there part of it they'll say maybe part of the hill was on a hill there's part of the hill and then if that were the case then they still have to do certain leveling at the top of the hill they would they would have to uh, certainly build up uh, soil around that they would have to have retainers so that they could do that and essentially they would have to based on where it is and what i've seen they'd have to retain it as they built that soil up and would have to compact it as they go and the point is this Doing that is just as much, it is more important concerning the structure as a whole. Okay, so if we want to go with Solomon built it in the first place and then Nehemiah and Ezra came back and built it again and we want to say that's the structure and that's the place. Well then, an integral, foundational, foundational part of that is the foundation. So if he says not one stone is going to sit upon another and they want to say, well, that's just the temple. That's just the temple and the buildings up there on the, the mount, the level top of it. When I'm telling you that you've got none of that if you don't got that foundation, the building up of the earth, the compaction, the retaining walls, holding that all in for that mount. I say they count. I also say that if um, if the establishment narrative is true, and when everything, um, if the siege was on the Palestine Jerusalem, which I, I got to kind of laugh, it's comical, because it just wouldn't take much <laughs> to besiege it. It's not that big, man. And I mean, they've built it. They've put in so many more houses and buildings and they've built outside of their actual, there is an old wall that, that does encompass this place um, that was there quite quite a long time ago, at least when Mark Twain went. And, and that whole narrative about Twain and him going there and when he went there and what was there and why he went there, the language that he used, the people that he went with, this is something I'm definitely going to explore more in the future. Remember, his book was called The Innocents Abroad. Anyways, um, it's not that big. So even if the establishment narrative was true and there was a siege there, and there was all this, all this gold in, in this rather small, it's not that big. It's a rather small area. It's a couple few acres. It's not that big. But if there was all this gold in there, and, uh, and they say that they, they burned, and I don't know what they burned, man. There's not much for trees there. There's not much for wood that could traditionally be used there without having to import it. Not good lumber, big beams, you know, you can saw out of it and use as structural members. So I don't know what they burned. There's a lot of stories in the Bible where somebody burns out a city. They burn it. In Palestine, based on the, the materials that you have available, Anyway, so they say that the, the Romans set fire to the place and that, um, that that fire burned so hot. This is another, I guess, a 9-11 story. The fire burned so hot that it melted all the gold in there, which melted into the blocks of the place that uh you know the temple itself maybe all the, the structures around and so they had to disassemble all of them to get to the gold and it went between everything right that's the that is really the establishment story my problem is this <laughs> unless it was in j just a few cases they wouldn't be taking apart the blocks necessarily to get to the melted gold they'd be taking apart the floor the foundation because that's usually where things go when they liquefy they go down to the floor 
And I wouldn't think that the, the foundation blocks that we see in the Palestine Jerusalem, where they say is the Temple Mount, would actually be the floors anyways. So really, the Romans would really have no need, as far as I'm concerned, to probably take that whole thing apart to get to the gold. And if that's the case, the establishment story that that happened, then why is the um, the Ark the Triumph that they made uh, concerning like Titus's victory? I don't know that. Yeah, that was on a victory uh, arc or arch. We see this um, this relief that's supposed to be Roman soldiers carrying away all of the items of the temple. Well, how how did they do that if they melted them all? Eh? That doesn't make a lot of sense. If we're to believe the establishment's narrative, they, they melted all of that, and that's why they had to take the thing apart, and that's why this makes sense. But the problem is we've got those reliefs that were made which show them carrying the vessels from the temple intact away from it. So I don't really believe that that is how the beat Yahweh it's just the house of Yahweh, not the temple that beats Yahweh. I don't think that was how it came down. And if you read the Bible, the actual real beats Yahweh was created with a lot of lumber in it. it. used a lot of lumber in it. They used stone also, but they used a lot of lumber. To where if you did set it afire, that might be enough because there was so much lumber in it to account for a lot of very key structural members that that really could have brought the thing down and perhaps it was just demolished from that point whoever did it uh, perhaps they were wanting to send a message to the people or the world at the time so i really believe that just the fact that 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 foundation in Palestine, Jerusalem, still standing as it does, speaks directly against the possibility of Palestine again being the location of biblical events. So I'll stop with that uh, part of it, and we'll carry on with uh, with this narrative in Luke. Um, so there is some really odd and interesting things about the wording that's actually used here and I don't know that I I actually wrote um, this down let's see Luke does not include what we see in Matthew 24 3 in Matthew you show Jesus says what he says then goes out to the Mount of Olives his disciples come to him privately and he explains in Luke he just starts going on right there in everyone's hearing or so it would seem so they are not parallel in that sense. Uh, what I did want to bring up briefly is that when you look at the language itself, look at the underlying words in uh, Luke, it says, um, some spoke uh, to him and were pointing out how uh, the temple was adorned with goodly stones and gifts. That's a really, the words that are used there are really interesting because they are used elsewhere in other places uh, typically, well, the first one, the goodly stones, typically um, denoting smaller stones. Like, is if you set a place with a massive amount of small stones, which would be, if you had that many small stones and you and you inset them into the exterior of, of a place, that would tr truly be pretty fantastic looking um i think the, the the cathedral in red square is just an amazing looking building and you know perhaps we would be thinking of something far more like adorned in that way we don't see we don't see things built or still standing today that are just amazingly adorned okay First off, and secondly, I want to bring something up that again goes against the establishment narrative, and that is the fact that when Yahweh was promising to the remnant that had come back from Babel, that had been waiting and not rebuilding 
the, the house of Yahweh because they were put off by the Samaritans who in their slimy little cowardly way sent letters to um, Kerush or Cyrus and Darius or Darius, um, basically telling a lot of lies and insinuations about the remnants that had come back to rebuild. So um, the prophet Hagi um, gives them a prophecy that they're to start building again. Now in this, Yahweh tells Hagi to tell the, the children of Israel, mostly Judah, that the uh, the temple that they were about to build, House of Yahweh, was going to be superior to the last one, Solomon's temple. Now that is in complete opposition to most of the establishment narratives who try to tell us that the Temple of Solomon was far more glorious than the one built, they will call it usually Nehemiah's, and then they'll sometimes say that Herod did a lot of things to it, add-ons, and so on and so forth. I think the reason that they do this goes back to these occult um, meanings that they apply uh, to a lot of things. And this is why they would tell us these things, because uh, they don't wash. If Yahweh said uh, through the prophet Hagi that the second one was going to be much better, much finer than the first, then either we believe that or we believe the establishment narrative. Okay, so forward in Luke, starting at Luke 21 and 7. So now here in, um, starting in Luke 21, 7, is where things get a little weird, <clears throat> just in the sense that we're not looking just at some sort of criticism of Luke, which was never the point in the first place, but some oddities. Luke 21, 7 is when his... He says what he says about the place being destroyed. In 21.7, the response from his disciples is interesting in the way that it's different than in Matthew. In 21.7, it says, And they said to him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what sign, and then in gray, will there be? So let's say, and what sign, when these things be? shall come to pass. That is their response to him saying that the whole thing was going to be torn down, which would have been a big deal, especially if this Beit Yahweh was, I figure something that's just like a national symbol, a structure that's a na national symbol that has stood <clears throat> for more generations, <laughs> like a millennia, that long. The first one destroyed right by um, Nebuchadnezzar. And now they're hearing this one. Their response, I think, is very appropriate as, um, as it's expressed here in Luke. Because that's a big deal. Telling people, even people who are now simply living in a kingdom that is a vassal kingdom to another power, they would still be pretty well uh, attached to that national symbol because that symbol to them, of course, also was the symbol that Yahweh was among them. It's used in the Law and the Prophets as a symbol that Yahweh is among them and Yahweh is with them. And he says it's going to be destroyed, going to be torn down. If that's the case, then I would think that they would naturally just conclude that that is signaling the end of what? The end of the covenant, the end of Judah's end of the covenant. You see, Israel had been put away and cast out of the land long before. Judah had not. They were kept in store. 
Why? So that Yahweh could keep his promise to Dud, Duid, David. That he would have a descendant that would always sit on the throne of Israel. So Judah, even though Judah had acted far worse than Israel for a long time, was kept in store for that to happen. This is part of the reason why, even when I look at the problems with these Gospels, but I look at the place and role that Jesus played, that I'm far more likely to lean towards there being a core truthful reality being expressed either through one or multiple Gospels that is a direct um, fulfillment of a lot of what we see in the prophets, specifically the prophecy uh, or covenant with David and um, other covenants and prophecies. That's why even with all these problems, I keep leaning towards that. So now, this is what his disciples' reactions are, as according to Luke. But in Matthew, they're actually kind of different. In Matthew 24, 3, they add a little bit that we don't see in Luke. And it makes it a little bit, I think it makes it a little more difficult, maybe a little more confusing. In 24, 3 of Matthew, it says, And he sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what the sign of thy coming? And the end of the world. The interesting thing about this is we could get into something that some... Um, authors have addressed. This is the first time we see this Greek term <clears throat> parousia. And I, I do a little commentary here in my document about it. So what I wrote, I must think either Luke's account is a bit more accurate or there has been some misunderstanding of the question asked in Matthew. Luke makes sense when what'll be the sign but matthew as it is translated suggests the disciples believed in a sort of second coming that's the idea we get as soon as we see that we get this idea second coming and the end of the world of course the second coming in the end of the world and i'll tell you preachers and charlatans have used these very emotionally fueled figures of speech, terms, ideas, to really control the emotions of their congregants for a long, long time. So, um, <clears throat> yet nowhere before this is there any suggestion of such a thing. Perusia. This is the Greek word, coming, okay? It may be better translated, manifestation, from para, beside, near, issuing from, against, contrary to, forward, hence, toward, near, or against. And aus, substance. So, visitation, as a, like an equivalent of parousia, like, you know, they translate it as your coming, maybe not, bodily. It isn't sure, it, since Paul had to clarify when a parousia was in bodily form in 2 Corinthians 10.10. 10. In 2 Corinthians 10.10, 10, Paul says that, he wants to come to them, he uses that parousia, and he has to add, so they understand what he's saying, in bodily form. So based on the uses that I've found so far, and it was just a cursory uh, search, 
this Perusia. Okay, they do use terminology that suggests your coming or your appearance. However, it is also terminology that if you read it differently, and I'm not saying reading into it, I'm not, you know, suggesting eisegesis or anything like that. I'm simply saying that we can see certain terminology and it is possible to see it being expressed in more than one way. And especially if we understand the, uh, the operative word, we could see it maybe in a different way. So if we understand parousia as being <clears throat> more like a manifestation, and they use the word right before parousia denoting your the way that could also be taken as the manifestation that you're referring to. And then if we see it that way, and we don't have to twist anything to see it that way. I can go real quick here to um, Matthew 24, 3 and click on it and go to... Um, Greek New Testament, this is TR, Textus Receptus. There are other copies that do vary from Textus Receptus, which I am not referring to right now, but any, we could to see what it says in, in those. And there are a lot of copies of Matthew out there in Greek that do have variations. So we see Perusias right here in G3952. And as they're asking him this question, and they they get to uh, this little part with Perusia, which is translated as thy coming, they say uh, to, and then they say uh, semion, so sign, um, and then tes, um, which is essentially... This is where we get into something that's very much like Masoretic because it'll tell you, well, it could be the, uh, this, that one, he, she, it, etc. We can see that if we click on it, how it is, it's used. Which, who, those, this, whosoever, some, your, what, when, footstool, <laughs> together, never, whoso, these, while, whose one, thine, whom ever more openly, state, avenge, Day lest like-minded others uncircumcised. Whatsoever again another any avenged backward cause Chamberlain company content custom do double earthly and estate exceeding forth friends gate henceforth much necessary outward particular pleasure principle remaineth spiritually such there's then true whereby wise. That's literally how many different ways this word, tess, is translated. This is why I tell you these things. Here's all of the variations. So yeah, it's absolutely, totally logical. It follows logically and, and objectively that we can look at this a different way that they were saying something in a different way and then the next word is cess which they would say thine or thy own this your because he's the one who made the claim your okay which your or thine own parousius manifestation this thing you're saying would come to pass. Now, if you look at the way that they are saying it, and you look at the way that this would be constructed grammatically, were it written, were they speaking in Obri, not Greek, that this translation from how they might frame this, because for one thing, Obri doesn't contain um, a lot of more complex uh, or flowery parts of speech so that in some ways it does sound like if you were to translate something um, 
Obery into something very mechanical, that it would sound like pigeon talk, you know, him go there, for a good reason, because it doesn't need those extra things. When you start understanding the way that it's constructed and used, it doesn't need those things. Greek has a lot more of those flowery extras. So just putting a question that may be being asked in Obery, which if it's being asked in Obery, first off, it's usually going to be preceded by me or me. This indicates that a question is going to be uh, being asked. Um, if it's where, they might say ane. And um, this manifestation could be expressed in, in a lot of different ways, depending because a word like manifestation or appearing or something happening, an event, um, because of the Masoretic lexicon could be expressed in a lot of different ways. What I'm saying is this does not have to be them thinking of a second coming. And there's clues to why. One of them is the fact that this is never mentioned at any time before this. They wouldn't have had a clue or the inkling that there would be a second coming as we think of it or an end of the world as in a, a great catastrophic universal end of the world event more as in the end of the world as we know it which they weren't feeling fine about. So they ask him, in this sense, I would say that comparing Luke and Matthew is productive because perhaps it was that whoever was penning Luke, they simply thought those questions were appropriate. And they did not think there was a need because Luke is quite condensed as compared to Matthew. It's very condensed. They didn't think there was any need for the addition of this question concerning Perusia, okay? Or the end of the age, and perhaps Luke's, Luke 21.7. I'm going to refer to it one more time before they say this. Absolutely. When will these things come to pass? They don't ask the end of the age, aeon, in Luke. They just, they, they simply ask him, What's the sign, Sigmos, and when shall these things happen? They're specifically talking about the temple being destroyed because, again, I am being repetitive, but the temple was and would have been to them a symbol of Yahweh being with Judah, the children of Israel. Because it wasn't just Judah there. It was Levites, Benjamites scattered pockets maybe of, of other Israelites here and there. Remember, Simeon was likely absorbed into Judah. That was one of the prophecies from Jacob, as we understand it, in Genesis 49. So, let's see. Move forward a little bit here. Um, manifestation, something expected, associated with the speaker. And when the disciples spoke to Yusho, Jesus did they believe they spoke to him? This is just one more point. When they spoke to him, since he had already told them and made it clear publicly that he is speaking the words of Yahweh. He's not speaking his words. He never claimed to be God or Yahweh. He claimed to speak all the words of Yahweh. He claimed that anything he did, because a lot of what he did, his ministry, his life, um, death, burial, resurrection, these were so th these were very much, very akin to the signs of a prophet that a prophet would perform as oftentimes object lessons directly to Israel. He was doing everything based on the command of Yahweh. So when they spoke to him, were they speaking to him? Were they speaking to Yahweh? What were they thinking? when they were speaking to him, when they were asking him these things. I just think it's a pertinent question. Okay. Now, Luke 21, 8. According to Luke, he says, Take heed 
that you be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am, and I crossed out Christ, because in Luke it just says, I am, ego I me. And the time draws near, go ye not therefore after them. Ego I me, I am. So this has been confused in other Gospels where they try to say, well, see, Jesus is, he's claiming that he's God right there. He says, I am. It's, it's, a, it's a common Greek that's used. It's used a lot in the New Testament. Ego I me, I am. It's, it's an affirmation. He's saying, there will be many who will come in my name affirming me. absolutely believable because, well, first off, it's right there in the text. <clears throat> and you can cross-reference ego I me and see how it's used in a very common way as an affirmation. The reason that people would come in his name affirming him, not saying that they were the Christ or anything, and yet you'll have kooks that'll do that, um, but affirming him. You have to do that. Somebody who comes to deceive you if somebody comes to deceive you and they come to you and they say, hey, I'm here from the great Satan himself. And I just want to tell you a bunch of lies that are going to lead you astray and may get you and your loved ones killed. What do you say? It's not going to go over well. Nobody comes like that. When deceivers come... And we see this, especially in Christianity, in churchianity, um, public figures online now, not just the TV, mostly online. They are coming with the semblance and in the form of Bible believers, Christians, those affirming Jesus. That's how they get most people. They come with an affirmation of him, claiming that they are in the truth of the truth, and so on and so forth. And then they introduce um, deception, poisonous doctrine, and very, very destructive ideas. That's the way it works. That's all I see him saying here. Okay. Now in Matthew 24, 5, for a reference, it's... He says, for many shall come in my name, saying, <clears throat> I am Christ. Now, in Matthew 24, 5, he does use the Christos there, but he's saying the same thing. It's probably why they grade in the Christ word in Luke, even though Luke didn't include it. Because it's saying the same thing. He's saying they're going to come in my name. They're going to affirm that I am Christos, which if, if Christos is the... Um, the direct equivalent of Mashiach from the Old Testament, Obri, it completely makes sense. Anointed, and if they both mean anointed, they shall deceive many. So, good parallel between the two, right? Um, I won't go into this part of the notes Christos is admitted in Greek in Luke, uh, and I covered that. One wishes to deceive, I covered that. I'm sorry, guys, don't mean to be repetitive. Yes, I covered that. You see, the thing is, I remember my notes usually when I'm going over this stuff, and sometimes I don't actually realize that I'm literally um, telling you my notes verbatim as I go through here. Okay, so when we get to Luke 21.9, <clears throat> now the funny thing is, I think it's it's good, I didn't do it, but it would be good to determine. So he would have to know somebody would be recording what he was saying and what he was doing because he would know that, that Yahweh had sent him for a very special, certain purpose. He would know that that would be written down and recorded, so he would know people would read it down the road. But there are things that he says that are specifically directed to his disciples for their knowledge, for their time, you know. And there are things that he says that are probably going to be more productive for people reading them down the line. When his disciples ask him this, so then you have to wonder, 
what part of that is mostly for his disciples, for them to heed in their own time, based, you know, directly on their own lives, and what for the reader. And the reason I say that's interesting is because when it gets to the reference in Matthew, and there, we'll see it in Luke too, and I'll show you how interesting it is that they actually, that Luke does include this reference, though he does it not directly. When they get to that reference of the abomination of desolation, what's interesting is Matthew specifically says, let the reader understand. Matthew tells us something, and this is, I find, amazing. I really, I really do. I really do. Because of what I've covered in bringing it all together concerning the phantom prepeat of what's supposed to be the abomination of desolation as they tell us in this time uh, that's only recorded in these books of Maccabees. And I'm telling you, they're sketchy as all get out. But what we really see should have been manifested after Yusho had done what he did this after his time. It was a judgment on Judah. And it was a big one. And it was massive and complete. And here's the thing. We can further reference that if we go back and we read the prophet Hezekiah. Because um, Hezekiah is prophesying at the same time as Haggai when they had stopped work on the temple in the streets of um, Jerusalem and they were being told it's time to start up again. Zechariah is existing and prophesying at the same time. He is given a vision that actually complements the visions that Daniel was given from Daniel chapter 2 through chapter 7. And well, and chapter 8 and 9. A lot of Daniel. In the sense that he sees four Kiran, Q R N, four Kiran horns. And these four horns, specifically in the book of uh, Hezekiah, and I think it's chapters 3 and 4, are said that they will be the ones who scatters Judah, Jerusalem, and Israel out of the land, Canaan, their inheritance, and across the world, the four, these four horns. Well, what kingdom do we see four horns running? The third kingdom, which is Yun, which they try to tell us is Greece that kingdom. And according to the establishment narrative and the books of Maccabees, Greece did no such thing. But according to the prophets, which now harmonizes with what Jesus is saying, basically in both Luke 21 and Matthew 24 and 25, it was this third kingdom that would scatter Judah, Jerusalem, gone, final judgment. So that's a serious problem, of course, for the establishment um, model of Greece and Rome. Because we have Yun and the four horns that came up from Yun, four co-tribe kingdoms that were responsible for this scattering. And then after them and after Judah, what was left of Israel was scattered and the land left desolate. And I don't know the details of that, but after this, that's when the fourth kingdom arose that we know of now as the consortium of tribes that run Europe, that run America, that run the world. They're not even named in the Bible, and they are absolutely secretive. And if you're going to look at the Ashkenazim Jews and think that they're actually the, the ones running everything, that doesn't comport with what the Bible describes either. Those are front men for people who remain invisible, just like all of their symbolism shows us. That does not, that does not relieve them of responsibility for their actions. But 
it is always important to consider all of the facts in any case. Let's say if we're prosecuting someone, we have to consider all the facts. You know, some of those facts are motive. It's a big deal. Motive and intent big deals because that's going to tell us a lot about the crime and the nature and the weight of the crime okay that's why it's very important to understand who's who who's doing what who's um, who's the uh, the cowardly invisible um, I'll, I'll leave out my last pejorative that I, I use usually in my briefs but them these invisible people and the visible people that they use to do certain things. They use a number of visible people to do certain things. They use proxy armies. Daniel prophesied that very thing, that there would be a little horn that would rise among those four Kirin, four horns, and then there would be a little horn that would rise among the, the horns of that later kingdom, which may in fact be the same tribe or gathering of tribes that little horn maybe and it, it doesn't it, it had great strength but not by its own strength it was using other people to do its dirty work to wage its wars to subvert countries so on and so forth and so on and so forth so for us to think the Ashkenazim as visible as they are are the same people that are pulling those strings I think it's a bit unreasonable because in, in my mind, first off, it would make them careless and possibly stupid. Um, and whoever's running things, they're not stupid and they're not careless. They may be cowards, they may be underhanded, they may be liars, which they are all of those things. They're not stupid. Okay. So uh, Luke 21, 9 says, But when you shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass. But the end is not by and by. Now, I don't know why they chose to translate this end not by and by, because it's a very similar terminology in Greek between Luke and Matthew. Matthew 24, 6, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Just something I want to clarify about that. What does he mean when he says end? He doesn't mean end of the world. None of this, none of this is eschatological, folks. I don't believe that we're looking at anything up to this point between both Luke and Matthew that is eschatological. Otherwise, last things. I think he's talking specifically about what's probably going to occur in uh, his disciples' own lifetime so that they know what to look for because they asked him a direct question and he's giving them a direct answer to that direct question. What was the direct question? When will these things come? What are these things? The temple being destroyed, which they saw as a sign of the end of them being in good standing with Yahweh, of Yahweh being among them, and of them being able to remain in the land, even being a, a vassal kingdom as they were. And they would have had to have been from the time, look, from the time that Babel carried them away till um, Cyrus gave the order that they may go back and rebuild, till the groups of them came back and started rebuilding in Jerusalem and maybe others started trickling back in as they were allowed to on forward. And I don't know how many years this is, but I think you, you have to give something to Daniel 9 when he gives those 70 weeks. But there's some problems in that language that I won't go into now. However, it was a good deal of time that they were a vassal kingdom of Babel. Then they were a vassal kingdom of Paris and Mahdi. And then they were a vassal kingdom of Yun and the four Kirin factions of Yun. So even being a vassal kingdom as they were, they still saw it as this is the end. We can't have anything anymore now. If Yahweh is not with us, and if he allows his house, beats Yahweh, to be demolished utterly, 
that's the end. That is the end of us being any kind of a definable, coherent national expression in this place that he gave to our forefathers, which was now much smaller, of course, because the territories um, to the north of them, which is, is often referred to as Samaria, which is actually Shomron. Shomron was a capital uh, city and area of the northern tribes, technically in Zebulun, near Benjamin, but it became a, sort of an expression for this very large area in which most of these foreigners, which were brought in by Assyria and Babel, maybe more by Paris and Midi, lived. Even with the much smaller kingdom they had, they still saw that as, this is it. Once this happens, we've got nothing. We have no nation because he's not with us. When he has his own house destroyed, like when Babel besieged Jerusalem for the second time, and they destroyed it. They destroyed the beats Yahweh, and Yahweh allowed it. You have to remember that. Anything that happens from an enemy power against Israel, Judah, it's happening because he's allowing it. It's part of his will. It's part of the covenants. These are things that he told our forefathers back at Horeb. He didn't hide anything from them. He said, if you go astray, if you continue to be disobedient, I'll do these things and this and this and this and this. And if you continue and you continue and you continue, I'll do this, 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 and this. And it got worse and it got worse and it got worse. And um, any snot-nosed critic can say anything they want to about how harsh he is, the harsh judgments he brings, but none of them seem to consider how long he forbeared judgment on not only Israel, Judah, but on many nations before he brought judgment on them. And he warned them, and he would warn them, and he would warn them, and he would warn them. We even see this with Assyria, Nineveh. Right? He sent Jonah to Nineveh. Jonah didn't want to go, but he sent him. Jonah went. Jonah basically just preached 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. And everyone repented. And Yahweh forbeared his judgment for a long time. And then we see them being warned through the prophet Nehum. You see, Israel's prophets, they didn't just warn Israel. They, they interacted with Many people all around, everybody, really, with Mitzram, not Egypt, with Ashur, Assyria, with Edom, um, in ways that are quite different than the um, Christian identity views about Edom. They are oftentimes warned about their behavior and coming judgment. Moab, Amun, the Palestim, or the Philistines, more like Polish, the Polishtim. It's kind of a hard word to say. You might just say like Polished team. <laughs> the Polish team. Um, I guess Philistines was an easier transliteration, though it's not very accurate based on the lettering. He warned a lot of people. And he was very patient. He forestalled his judgment. And he did it with Judah for longer than anyone. But the destruction of that temple, the beats Yahweh, the house of Yahweh. I, I hate even using temple because we all get this idea in our mind that we've been sold of this, this place and this complex, which that's not what's reflected in the text. So I... And, and temple is actually quite a different word. And that's not what's used typically in the text. And the text beats Yahweh. That means the house of Yahweh, Yahweh's house. Beat, B-Y-T, beat Yahweh. So now he continues with this, um, this long discourse here. And uh, we do get in a lot of interesting wording 
um, that's being used when we start at Luke 21.10 and go forward. Uh, what I'm going to do is highlight that so that I can pick that one up next time. Because here's what's going to happen. Because the information in the Passion, the last few chapters of Luke and Matthew, Mark, John, it is so dense. The information is very dense. It is very rich. And then when you are making comparisons, there's a whole lot to talk about. I'm going to go through these kind of slowly, and I'm going to make sure these videos aren't too long. Right now, it's, uh, it's at 1.15, which I think is just fine. So I'll cut it off here, and I'll start up um, episode number 15 at Luke 21.10. So, uh, till then, see ya.